everybody, welcome to The Gayest Generation, where we hear LGBTQ plus older adults speak for themselves. Every episode, we sit down with a different member of the LGBTQ plus community who laid the foundation for the freedoms we have today. Their stories make noise where there is silence, and that silence has lived for far too long. In this episode, we speak with Kazi Kozachenko, the first openly LGBTQ plus person to be elected to public office in American history. We talk about her time on the Ann Arbor City Council, the importance of voting, and we hear her advice for queer politicians today. This is The Gayest Generation. If you could do us the honor, tell us who you are and how you identify. Um, My name is Kathy Kozashenko, and I identify as a lesbian. Um, My pronouns are she and her. I don't know if there's a third pronoun. I'm supposed to forget. (laughs) Well, it's very wonderful to be with you here today. And now I always try to think of a creative way, how, how to start these sorts of conversations. But at the end of the day, I always kind of, you know, the best way to start is at the beginning. So could you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and when you grew up. Where are you from? I grew up primarily in Toledo, Ohio, um, in the um, 50s and 60s. I am um, 69 years old now, and I lived in Toledo when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And what would Toledo be like during the 50s and 60s? Is it hustling, bustling? Set the scene for us a little bit there. Well, I, I mean, I can only tell what it was like. I mean, it was a it was a vibrant manufacturing um, small town back then. There was the Autolite plant. There was um, Libby Owens Glass. Their um, Jeep company was there. So there were a lot of um, jobs, and I would imagine they were they were decent jobs. It had um, they were union jobs, so it had a union flavor, which I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have known as a child. My grandmother passed that on to me because she was a union worker, and she would tell stories of um, you know when there were strikes. Uh, you know, they told her cousin, "You cannot cross the picket line. You can't uh-huh. be a scab." So um, that's that's sort of the kind of. Um, it was I lived in the um, sort of the western I wouldn't say suburbs but I didn't live right in an urban area mm-hmm. and what kind of kid were you I was a um, well I was two different types of, of kid actually um, when I was uh, up to eight years old I was sort of a very um, I would say, you know, self-centered, little bossy little girl that um, <laughs> had all these ideas and, you know, liked to, you know, drum things up and get things moving. Um, I also read a lot that was instilled in me by uh, my mother and her parents. Um, when I was almost um, nine years old, my mother died quite suddenly. So the child I became was very different. Uh, I was uh, more quiet, more withdrawn. I didn't have the support I had from my immediate family. My father's mother raised my brother and I, and very much understood the loss that um, I had suffered and was um, protective of my little brother who was three years younger than I. In terms of of your schooling, did you find yourself to be a um, focused student? Um, Were you like socially? What is it like to go to high school during that time also? What was high school like? Well, high school, you know, high school was interesting. It was sort of a transition period. I went to high school in Plymouth, Michigan, and um, we we had moved there from, from Toledo. And I was, you know, probably a pretty serious person and, um, you know, certainly not in the popular crowd at all. I did have some friends from 
doing um, student theater, that sort of thing. But um, towards the end of my high school career, quote unquote, things that I was interested in suddenly became um, more popular, being politically aware, being against the um, Vietnam War, th those sort of things that I was in tune with and oddball uh, about my entire high school career um, suddenly gained some recognition and volume uh, as the years went on. I graduated in 1970 and my greatest fear as I watched everything that was going on in the college campuses, my greatest fear was that I was going to miss all these, you know, demonstrations and calls for radical change and everything like that. Um, I didn't miss them. I, I was involved in college. And um, in fact, since you men mentioned what high school was like for me, I, um, one of the first things I ever did in terms of social action, well, let me back that up a little bit. I was, um, I was what you would call a, you know, a teenage person that was interested in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember what I did or was going to do, but I know I was going to go to um, a convention and be involved in some way. And um, when Bobby Kennedy was killed, I was completely devastated. Of course, when President Kennedy was killed, I was just a child. But when Bobby Kennedy was killed, I knew who he was. I knew what he stood for. I was absolutely going to um, campaign for um, his presidency. Then he was assassinated. So um, that hit me. That hit me very, very hard. The other thing I did, not letting you talk much, Jacob. I don't got much to say, friend. You keep on talking. Okay. <laughs> the other thing I did in high school, um, this was when Cesar Chavez started the, um, the United Farm Workers um, Union. And I was a big supporter of that. We did demonstrations um, outside of grocery stores back then um, in the late 60s. However... Um, my father didn't allow me to do that. He was afraid that somehow there might be some, um, of course, he was, his fears had no basis, but he was afraid there might be some trouble or whatever. So he kept me um, uh, not able to join the pickets as I would have liked to and would have been really good for me socially in terms of being around people who shared my values. But I did... Um, probably in my senior year of high school, it could have been junior year, I did bring in a speaker from the United Farm Workers to my little um, middle class, upper middle class, white um, town mm -hmm. of Plymouth, Michigan, talk about the um, grape boycott. I don't remember if it was grape and lettuce at that particular time, mm -hmm. um, but that was the first thing really I ever organized so that, that was wow. my high school that was my high school career in your peers in your high school did they catch the political i don't want to call it the political bug did did they, did they catch the activist bug as well um mostly no we had um we, we had a student that was there from england i don't re i don't know if he was an exchange student or if he was um, had moved here, but um, he was very good looking and then had the, you know, the added allure of the British accent. And oh, he yes. was very, very politically um, savvy and interested. So that got a lot of the, the, um, the high school girls <laughs> interested. <laughs> I can imagine. Yes. And during this time, were you becoming politically active in your year in Plymouth, Michigan? What is your understanding of your own sexuality during this time? I, I didn't really have understanding of it. I, I had never even, I was pretty, 
wouldn't call it backward. I just wasn't in touch with um, with a lot of things. I didn't even know that same sex sexual relations and intimacy and you know primary partnership. I didn't even know it existed. I found out once I went to college. <laughs> Uh, and I, I can definitely relate with that. In these in these conversations I've had with folks for the podcast, I'm always interested to ask, when did you know you were gay? And I also like to ask, when did you know what gay was? Right. And if I heard you, if I understand you right, you said once coming to college, you said, hey, oh, this thing that I see over here, I might be that thing too. Do I understand that? Right. Correctly. I mean, I think I knew earlier on. I just didn't know what it was or what it meant. I remember having a sort of a crush on one of my um, high school friends, you know, way earlier, um, mm -hmm. you know, beginning of high school. And I, my grandparents, um, my mother's parents who didn't live near um, near us anymore, would send me um, these big boxes of Barbie doll clothes and, and Barbies and cans. And um, so I played with them a little bit. I really wasn't that interested. But I never could figure, I, I really literally could not figure out what Barbie saw in Ken. <laughs> I liked Barbie, but I had no idea why you know, she was interested in Ken. Yeah. I was interested in Barbie. But I never wanted to be Ken. So um, that was probably my earliest inkling that something's a little different here. I mean, I didn't put two and two together until, until later. Of course. And, and how could you, at, at least in my experience and, and from listening to, to what you have said, there, there, we weren't given a language. We didn't have a language. We didn't have um, the words to label the things that we felt about ourselves or, or the people around us. Um, with that being said, as you're becoming more politically active, um, how did you settle on coming to the University of Michigan? Well, I had to go in state because, you no, know, there wasn't wasn't much money, um, and I wanted to go to most radical university I could find. So yeah. Berkeley and U of M were, and I was lucky that um, one was less than a half hour from where I lived. <laughs> so it was, it was an easy choice. It was the only school I applied to. I knew that I had the grades to get in and I got in. I want to go back to something that you said about, um, just for the just for the younger listeners, about yes, us, being not, us not being visible in our lifestyle, not being visible with everything that's on TV now, in, in terms of all the you know the Netflix and the streaming. Back then, um, even in terms of people that weren't um, LGBTQ, yeah, you know, I remember the show Partridge Family. No, mm -hmm. not Partridge. Who were they? Ones that um, Brady Bunch. That's it. The Brady Bunch, a family that got together and they were just the perfect family. You didn't see on TV real struggles that families had, the real dysfunction that was within the four walls of perhaps your own home. So there was there was such a, a fantasy land um, on TV of what reality was um and certainly we were not on we were not anywhere in the thinking but um you know women and what they went through and and a real a real life of a of a woman who was barely just being able to go out and earn a living back then so that's all i wanted to add there was there was a lot of um invisibility in this, it, you're saying let alone gay representation, which there was none on TV and films. What was being represented on TV and film was this fluffy, happy, 
butterflies and rainbows. Well, maybe not rainbows, but <laughs> <laughs> butterflies and unicorns, this wonderful, fluffy world. And you're telling me that's not the world that we were living in. Well, no, I mean, families back then were the same as families now. I mean, there might have been more, certainly when, uh, when I was young, there were many more families that it was just a single wage earner. Um, and that, that changed. So yes. families were families were a lot different and the choices women had um, were a lot less. And then of course that led to, um, when I ran for office, one of the things we talked about was gender roles and gender stereotypes, because that, you know, that led to man being what society dictated a man had to be, you know, strong, the provider, don't cry, don't show softness. So it was just wrong on, uh, on so many levels for people, for humanity. Oh. And today I had just read in the news that um, the first movie written and starring a queer person with an all LGBTQ cast will be coming out later this year. And it's like, oh my, that is a that that feels huge. Um, and it, I, I think it, it, it exists as kind of a um, way to look at. I can look at this moment and go, so much has happened over these years. So much um, progress has happened. Will the movie be any good? We don't know. Right, <laughs> we'll right. This, yeah. Um. So to, to, to uh, backtrack just a little bit here, you're at the University of Michigan. Now, we, I have heard a lot of incredible stories about what, the, what Ann Arbor was like and what the university was like during the early 70s. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the whole, what, what was Ann Arbor like during that time? There was, there was a lot of political action, um, very staunch, staunch, um, anti-war actions. Um, the movement was asking, um, not asking, demanding that the university divest from um, different corporations that um, made war products, um, you know, whether it was defense industry, um, defense inter industry things or whatever. But there was a huge anti-war um, anti movement. Um, I, you know, back then, there was, a, there was a big women's movement, and it was also very much um, uh, lesbian identified as well. Like, obviously, you didn't have to be a lesbian to be in the movement, but, um, you know, people would say things, well, you can't be a real feminist unless you're a lesbian, which is <laughs> ridiculous, but, you know, that's, that's a part of the times I was living in, in the, the bubble land of Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor, Michigan back then. Um, but significant work was being done to start um, a, um, I, I don't know what the right words are, but a, you know, people within the university that would be the outreach people for lesbian and gays um, on the campus. Um, so there was a lot of work done, um, done all over. And I, I, you know, back then it was more, I don't want to say it was more separatist than it is now, but that back then, um, you know, people of color had their own organization and, you know, we hope to work in alliance with them, but it was not a, um, they wanted their own um, and, and made their, their own organization. And it wasn't, um, so that's, that's the way, the way it was. And I, I, I recently read, um, What's her uh, Judy Human's book? She was a big disability, or she still is a big disability uh, disabilities rights activist. And in her book, she talks a lot about how the disability rights movement had to align 
with the black movement, which was a completely separate and different thing. And they had to align with the LGBTQ movement, which is a whole different thing. And to really come together in that huge way was the key. Now, um, what was the political scene like in Ann Arbor at that time? How did you get involved with the Human Rights Party? Well, when I got to, um, when I got to the campus, I looked, um, I looked at what was, was going on and I found this organization of, um, of radical young people that believed in um, democratic socialism for, you know, listeners they would, would um, might think of Bernie Sanders and his platform to uh, most be able to understand the kinds of things that we, we stood for. Um, and we, we did um, strike support work. Um, we supported union organizers. We supported um, welfare rights um, uh, initiatives. And, um, you know, that was some of the kind of, of work we did. And it was all about, um, you know, the fact that 1% have all this wealth and power and, um, people at the bottom are, you know, duking it out and trying to make a living and, you know, oftentimes fighting each other. So um, I found this party, which was, um, was Michigan party. It was not just an Ann Arbor party. And I became active uh, with them. I learned a lot from them. Many of the leaders um, who I am proud to call friends today were graduate students. So they were, uh, they were older than I and more experienced um, than I was. We were a, um, a democratic organization. We voted on and um, did our platform a consensus. Uh, I'm not saying we never voted, but we tried to reach consensus. Mm. We felt like um, back then that, you know, we're not looking <laughs> to make small reforms and put band-aids on here and band-aids there. But there needed to be a more serious a redistribution of um, wealth and resources to really do anything effective. As part of our organizing strategy to get our message out, and we were very much um, in support of women's movement, um, lesbian and gay liberation, and all of the roles that were changing back then. I mean, this was a hugely fundamental time in, um, in consciousness changing. What people thought of as male and female, um, heterosexual, homosexual, all of this was being um, examined and challenged. And we used to say personal is political. It's not just political, it's not just going out uh, and demonstrating or voting or whatever. The personal is political as well. And with, with the personal being political, did that influence your decision to run for public office? I think... I think it made it more, I think it made it more appealing in that there was a, there was a holistic outlook to society and to the world we wanted to live in and the world we wanted to change. We by no means thought, okay, change is only going to the ballot box and um, electing someone. Mm -hmm. Because if that's all we do, um, a person you elect, no matter you know who good, 
how good they are. You know, they can be co-opted. They can be just um, cannot move the other people towards their views or towards the change they want if there is no pressure in the outside community. And, you know, I think an example of that is nobody uh, would be talking well, now maybe, but certainly 10 years ago, nobody would be talking about climate change unless there were unless there were activists out there. It's not coming from the politicians to the people. It's yes. coming from the people, the politicians and people demanding action and people saying, these are the facts. We cannot continue with business as usual, profit as usual. We're not going to have a planet to live on. Once again, it's going to affect the um, poorest people, the poorest nations, most severely. So um, that's that was exactly our perspective. It wasn't like, oh, let's elect people to office and here they're going to do all these, make all these great changes. What what running for office and winning for winning office allowed us to do was. Um, Talk about our values, um, perhaps restructure things in the city budget so that there were more social programs, um, more money for social programs, things like that. Um, that's sort of, that was part of the value of you know, running for these local offices. And I think that anyone who who is alive and breathing right now in this country. And um, we're taping this in spring of 2022, I, I might add. I'm sure you say that at the beginning of the, of the podcast. But we have to realize how crucial voting is right now because <sighs> people with the, the vote are pushing things backwards. Things that I was fighting for as a 20-year-old woman, I'm now out fighting for in the streets as an almost 70-year-old woman, such as a woman's right you know, to reproductive choice and freedom. So now, now, even more than ever before, we need to use what power we have at the ballot box and also then push our elected officials to do um, represent people. And why do you think we've regressed? Why, as you said, why are you fighting for things in 2022 that you initially fought for in 1972? And it's a, it's a heavy question. It's a, it's a really, it's a really, um, it's a really heavy question. I think that there is every time there are problems in the economy, it allows people to um, look and blame other people. And I think that I think that the um, election. Barack Obama was a hugely wonderful thing. Uh, it was a good thing. It also struck fear in parts of many people. And then you have a um, another person elected who opens the can of worms and lets this um, this racist theology, you know, come out of the can to where it can be even not that bad to speak it, you sure. know, before. The can of worms has become dinner table talk. Right, right. And it's, it's not, um, and then people on, so that's, that's one thing. And they, you know, they stymied the ability of an outgoing Democratic president to 
appoint someone to the Supreme Court. Yet they did. They did that. So now we have a Supreme Court that really doesn't does not represent people. It represents a minority of um, religious, you know, right wing Republicans. Yet all of the Republicans are falling in line with this. And so that's an that's an interesting question that I'm not going to be able to. Um, answer as to why they have been able to gain this much power and why you know, there used to be and, and we don't want to waste our time talking about Republicans, but there used to be people yeah. that you, you could disagree with, but perhaps respect. There were even people who were fiscally conservative actually liberal on the social issues and now it's nobody is nobody is willing very few there are a couple um very few are willing to speak up um in the republican organization and counter trumpism so and it, I recall, I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, are you sure? Yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly from our first conversation, and spoiler alert to the listeners, when you were elected to Ann Arbor City Council, you caught some flack for working alongside some of the Republicans in the city council as well. Oh, um, I, yeah. Do I understand that correctly? I did, as I'm sure I, I, I would today, although today I wouldn't. Today, I wouldn't even dream of it. Um, sure. So the first year, first year I was on city council, the um, Democrat, no, the Republicans controlled the council. Second year, it was five Republicans. I can't, and I'm not getting it right here. Five Republicans, five Democrats, and me. Um, mm -hmm. so it, long story short, um, the Democratic Party in Ann Arbor back then was a, you know, moderate, if not conservative organization. I mean, they were not addressing any of the issues that we addressed. Um, you know, we had a rent control bill. Um, it, it didn't pass, but uh, we had things with economic teeth. And they were just your regular, you know, typical, moderate, who certainly weren't progressive. So they assumed I was their sixth vote. And, you know, no one tried to bring me into any conversations, negotiations, discussions. It was just like I was sitting there and I was supposed to vote with them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I had people, obviously, that worked with me um, on council issues, on legislation, um, you know, a law student for one, a med student for another. And they were much more savvy at these things than I was at my age. And we met with the Republicans and hammered out a budget, which gave us um, things that we wanted and gave them things that they wanted, but things that were nothing against our values or, or nothing. And so we came in and um, stunned the city council by voting. Um, the Republicans voted up a budget with my vote. And um, and Ann Arbor newspaper, student newspaper, uh, was not happy with me at all, or the Human Rights Party. But, uh, that passed. That passed. And how old were you when you were elected to city council? Probably 20, maybe 21. I am thinking about if 21-year-old Jacob was elected to city council. I cannot fathom it. 
<laughs> what was it like being a 21 year old person coming into a space like the Ann Arbor city council and even beyond that running as an openly lesbian candidate at that time, when you're coming into the council, how were you received? Well, first of all, we had two council before my election, two years before my election, the human yes. rights party elected two candidates, one from the student ward, Nancy Wexler, and one from a, uh, which we expected to win that ward. Then from the first ward, which was a mixed student, low income, working class, we also won that ward. And that was um, Jerry DeGreep was the candidate and then the councilman who won that war, um, won that election from the Human Rights Party. And in the course of them being on council, uh, both of them came out. And it wasn't a situation that they didn't want to run as openly gay. It was a situation that we were all young and we were all figuring out our sexuality back then. So, you know, wow. once they figured it out and were pretty secure, they went public as a, you know, because the personal is political and wanted it known. So when I got there, it was, um, it was old news already for, <laughs> um, in, in a sense. And I'm, um, not a real radical personality so I got along I got along fine and they, they treated me they treated me fine I only had one situation um we had a prayer at the beginning of every council meeting mm -hmm. and I don't remember that a minister did it they might have had ministers come in but mostly you know the the um a uh, mayor or somebody uh, the prayer or like I said one of the council people and I did I, I wrote a poem that um, was in honor of Inez Garcia who was a young woman who had been victimized and raped and I asked all the women on the council to stand I think there were two others and all the men to remain seated. And the, um, a couple of the Republican men, you know, thought I was, you know, pulling some kind of, I don't know, feminist stunt or anti-male thing or whatever. So they stood. And as I got into the poem and into the depth of what happened, they sat down, respectfully sat down. And... Um, that was a good moment. It was a moment that I, you know, it wasn't about a city issue or it was about a national situation. Um, I knew I was being heard. And so that was one of, and the poem is probably, it should be in the minutes because it, it was the invocation. And that's, um, so that was, that was one instance I can remember being, fairly well received after listened. Oh, and I think what you said is huge. It's after somebody listened. And right. I think that just speaks to the power of listening. Because what you think somebody might be about to say or what your preconceived notions of who they are might cause you to stand up during a time in which you're not meant to stand up. But if you listen, maybe you'll have the two cents to sit down. Right. Right. And that is a lesson I think men across the globe are still, um, we're still wrestling with that a little bit. Uh, I wish we could get farther, closer, but um, we're working on it. <laughs> so um, what does it, what, what, what does the day to day look like being a city council person at that time? It doesn't look like much, to tell you the truth. I mean, I'm sure there were committee meetings and, and, and things that I had to attend to. Um, you know, neither time was I 
the majority because I was one person. So I wasn't writing some kind of crafting, some kind of great legislation or coming up with plans. Uh, so I was still doing uh, my political work that included things that were not on the council, supporting the farm workers um, who were still boycotting lettuce, doing strike support, um, you know, a number of things like that. We weren't paid. Even I think right after my term, there was a uh, it became a paid it became a paid position. In um, of course, it's got to be the year after, right? How long? Um, how long were terms at that time? Two years. Did I hear you say two years? Two years. And two I, th years. I think the way it worked, there were five districts. Each, um, each district had two representatives. So every year, one of them was up for, uh, one of them was up to be reelected or a new person. The reason I ran for city council is to represent Human Rights Party and to move forward the ideas and the um, of this organization and try and mobilize more people to become involved with us to create a movement that would allow us to have a more just world. At the time that I was running, I felt like I felt like. Human Rights Party probably was not going to last. We had been, so because we had been unsuccessful in making it a community organization outside of the student movement and or outside of students being you know, the primary members of the Human Rights Party. And that would be fine if it was a, an organization that was dealing with university issues, student issues, we're trying to deal with citywide issues, national issues, um, you know, other kinds of issues. And as a viable organization, it couldn't be comprised only of students. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of the fact that when I was asked, you know, will you run? Um, instead of saying what I wanted to say, which was, I did say, no, I think there are so much better people. Well, the better people were getting their degrees and they were moving on out of Ann Arbor to have a career. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, I will run because I wanted to make sure that party, what was the viability of the party? One of the one of the most exciting things about me winning was that we had two more years, a voice on city council, to try and build our organization, to build that movement, and to um, share our ideas with with other folks. You know, working people, people that were trying to um, advance themselves, maybe not through the University of Michigan, but through some other means of gaining skills that would help them in the workforce and so on. So that was, you know, I was proud of that. And um, I'm proud of the fact, even though it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my initial idea that I would run openly gay. I, I never, you know, didn't think of it. Someone else did. They suggested it. My campaign manager did. And I said, I said, fine. And did have some interesting conversations on the campaign trail. So. And what would these interesting conversations look like? So two things happened in particular. One was that, um, I went in student dormitory and, you know, I'm knocking on doors and introducing myself and talking about um, talking about the party and the platform and what we hope to do. And um, met a young man. He said, well, um, 
I'm I'm a very religious Christian, but I believe God works in mysterious ways. So I'm going to vote for you. So that was that was that was one um, that was one situation I had, and then another situation that wasn't wasn't as good. I was knocking on doors at a dormitory by the hospital where a lot of nursing students lived. And I'm just going along door to door like I always did. And I talked to these two women and then I went, you know, I was walking down towards the next door and I could overhear them talking from behind the door. And one of them said to the other one, oh, that was her. Did you see her? Was she looking at you? Uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh-huh. I wish I had been a little braver because the story would be better. Well, it might be better. But what I wanted to do was go back, and knock on that door, and say to them, look, you've got the wrong idea here. What it means to be a lesbian and to, you know, be oriented to other women is not the same thing as how men are oriented towards women. It's not the same. You're, you're putting male sexuality on me as a woman. And I'm not, I'm not checking anybody out. I'm not, that's not me. And that's not what my sexuality is to me. Yes. And maybe if I could have quickly articulated that in my own young mind, I could have gone back and said it. But yes. I didn't think of that back then. I, it, uh, I knew it in my heart that that's what I wanted to say. I, I personally, I got if I had a quarter for every time I had one of those moments, I could probably do a load of laundry. Um, <laughs> and I think that for a lot of queer people, we have a lot of moments where we go, if I could go back and say this. Right. Well, that would be a good feeling. Right. Um, it, it, now, how did your family and friends react to you being elected to city council? And not only elected city council, but elected city council as somebody who's openly as somebody who's openly lesbian. Well, my father was happy that there was only one little tiny line about it in the Detroit Free Press. <sighs> um, My grandmother was fine with it. She was happy about it. She was proud. Um, She wasn't, she'd always been a Democrat her whole life. She wasn't a big political person. She was a union person. So my brother, my cousins, they, you know, people were okay with it. They knew I was left wing. So, you know, nothing surprised them. Ah, I see. And if somebody was in your shoes in 2022, let's say there's a queer woman running um, for city council somewhere in America, what advice would you have for that person? I would tell them to be who they are, to... um, hopefully represent a movement, um, not just a political party, um, to represent a movement, to represent uh, values and, and change and to make, uh, they don't already have them, to make alliances with other people that are on the um, chopping block of, of this society right now, people of color, uh, people who are marginalized. Absolutely. Um, in, in getting to know you and reading about you online, you are the first, ooh, let me get my words right. You are the first openly gay person to be elected to public office in American history. American history, wow. That sounded big. Well, it is big. A lot of people think that's Harvey Milk, but it is in fact you. What is it like to be a first? It's, it's 
humbling. I, over the years, I've had to think about this, especially with the internet. For a lot of years, I didn't have to think about it at all. <laughs> I've had to think about it, and I have two different, um, two different thoughts. I always have the thought was of, well, it shouldn't have been me. It should have been somebody else who was more oh. like totally LGBTQ focused. That that was, um, that should be the person that, you know, people look up to and has this historical position. But then on the other hand, I think, well, it was me. And I am a pretty, in many ways, a pretty ordinary person, except for my huge commitment to social change and to social and economic justice. Working together uh, with others is our only, you know, is our only hope. There are so many have much more in common with people than we do um, in terms of differences. And of course, in our community, I mean, it's not like the communities are separate. You know, the, the black community is us. You know, there's, there's, you know, black, lesbian, transgender, you know. So the, the uh, Latinx community is us. The immigrant community is us. So it's not, we're not, it's not separate. It's not separate. So, um, you know, we, we have a lot to fight for, but um, we fight with love and determination. Yes. Love and determination. And that's the only way we can win this battle of hate. And I think... <laughs> I have a lot of different responses to what you have just said. And I think initially I respond so um, warmly and so positively to what you call, what you refer to as humility. Um, one would hope that the people who represent them in public office would, would have the humility to, to know that yes, the personal is political but politics isn't about Kathy Kazachenko, the person. It's about how she represents the people. And I think that um, that's an element that we're missing a lot in, in, in current politics, where it becomes more of a cult of personality um, and, and less about how is this person representing the people? The um, focus is more on how did this person act on The View yesterday morning? And I think that that's, um, although I am <laughs> regrettably watching The View almost every morning, I think that uh, we need to refocus back to, to what you embodied and, and what you were just talking about. Um, I really hope the things that you said how do I put this? Sometimes it is very easy to feel um, powerless or that change is impossible. And I, I, I would just urge anybody who, who has ever felt that way, which is anybody with a pulse, to um, reflect a little bit on what you had just said and how love and determination are the two things that will bring us through. Um, but... I would be remiss. I do have here um, that maybe it was your time on city council that was responsible for the five dollar mar marijuana fee. Yeah, in the city of Ann Arbor. Well, actually, actually, no. That could be the five dollar marijuana fee. Could be what got me elected because <laughs> I was on the ballot with um, I was on the ballot with two ballot proposals. One was the five dollar marijuana fee, and the second. It's a rent control proposal. And, you know, me being the, you know, economic justice person that I am, that's what I tried to talk about. But students being the 
excuse me, self-interested people they were, and there's nothing wrong with that. Certainly. They were concerned about that $5 marijuana fine. Yes. And they, they certainly knew that, that proposal, my candidacy, when Jerry, when Jerry and Nancy ran two years before me, they ran from the Human Rights Party. So um, it was this stunning thing that Two people from this little third party won on city council. Two out of five seats, mind you. So at the time I ran and, you know, other people in the other districts, they were putting, particularly in the student district, in the, the ward that was student and low income and, and mixed, they put people up that looked like us and talked like us. But I think... There's no student living in Ann Arbor at that time that would have thought that the Democratic Party would have put $5 marijuana fine on the belt. Yes. That's what was happening in, in, uh, in, that, in that time. Mm. So what helped me? I'm sure it helped me. And for those for the listeners who might not be familiar with this, and please correct me if, if I have this wrong, if you were caught with pot on in the city of Ann Arbor, you could hand the cop a five dollar bill and walk away. I don't remember that, but it was it might have been that easy. It was yeah. it was if not, it at most it was like a parking fine. Sure. Yeah. Well, on behalf of myself and many students, thank you for setting that precedence. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'd like to ask you now uh, some questions. These are kind of more silly, fluffy, quick questions. Okay. I've asked this questionnaire to every person I've spoken with for this podcast. Your answers can be short. Your answers can be long. Your answers can be one word. Your answers can be no words. Okay. But I love kind of um, being able to compare the different answers between everyone that we've spoken with. So if I, with no further ado... Let me ask you this first. What do you feel about younger people using the word queer? I think it's fine now. It depends on the context, I guess. It, yeah. it depends on tone of voice. It depends, depends on what young people, I guess. Sure. What stereotypes about LGBTQ folks bother you the most? I think that I think that most, this is not a, I think that most people really do not understand um, transgender folks. I think mm -hmm. that they really, really don't understand. And um, those of us who are not transgender have to be able to listen to, um, uh, transgender sisters and brothers and try and be able to articulate and talk about this to people we come in contact with in our world, whether it's our brothers, our nieces. Uh, so that's, that's what I would say is, is, you know, one of the most important things that we need to do is to help make that make transgender people real yes and even within our own community the things that i've heard gay males say about transgender women specifically and transgendered men geez louise it's like can we even Fine. cheer for our own team can we even <laughs> it is wild um have you ever used a dating site or application oh heck yeah yeah I mean, I'm actually... it's 2022 baby yeah, I um, am, have been very successful quite recently, so. <laughs> hey, that's wonderful news. Um, Betty Davis or Joan Crawford? Betty Davis. There is a right answer, and that would be it. What was your first celebrity crush? I 
Gosh, I don't remember. That's, that's a bad question. <laughs> Love that Midler. Yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, what makes you happy? Having my life in balance, which is is usually, which really isn't, that's a, that's a corny answer because it's so, it's so untrue, but it's, it's a, it's an attempt. I think like, like everyone, what make, what makes me happy is to feel like um, I'm doing something worthwhile, that uh, I'm needed, but then also my own quiet time, you know, reading a good book makes me happy. Um, you know, having meaningful conversations with people makes me happy. Yes. What I heard you say is there's a lot of things that make you happy, and that's a pretty right. cool thing to be able right. to say. Um, what gives you hope? I do believe that people, we have come very far. Uh, with 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 social issues with people and how they look at you know men women non-binary you know people young people have put terminology into things that I was perhaps trying and not just me personally we were trying to say years ago in the women's movement as far as uh, gender roles, gender period. We didn't get quite that far. So I think we're on a, a positive progression, even though we're getting pushed back. And I believe in, believe in the goodness of people. And I believe in people's common humanity and their ability to understand more and more we're all connected we're yeah. all connected and if you go down i go down and vice yep. versa so i think that um you know people have mobilized for you know, reproductive rights for um rights of people of color people are Mobile, people are mobilizing until I don't even know what to say about the whole NRA and common sense gun laws. Mm -hmm. I do believe, um, listen to the mayor of Pittsburgh, Mayor, uh, mayor Ganey at the Women's March um, here, I guess it was last Saturday. What he said was, don't be angry. It's funny because I was standing there so angry thinking, I'm almost 70. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I've already done this. Yeah. And he said, don't be angry. Take this from them as an opportunity. as an opportunity for us to join together with all of the um, oppressed people in this country. And Ed Ganey is our first black mayor in the city of Pittsburgh. So it was, um, you know, we have an opportunity to look at what's going on and to join hands and move forward. And there are many more people willing to do that than there are hate-filled people. Yes. And I, when people say the silent majority, that's what I really think of. There's more people who have love in their heart quietly than the other way around. Um, now, you have been very kind, allowing me to ask you a million questions. If you could ask me any question, what's your question? I guess my question for you is... What do you see, you know, moving forward as a path to the LBGTQI movement? Um, what do you see 
you know, personally as what you're energized to do or get involved with. In addition to, I mean, you are doing great work now. I don't mean to say you're not. No. Hey, I, hey, just, yeah. I just, I'm curious as to how you see current times and our, our, you know, near future. I think that, um, and you had made mention of this earlier, I think that at the forefront of LGBTQ equality needs to be the T. Um, we need to show up more for, for trans folks. And it's been this way where we should have been standing up more and in, in, in doing more, I think, for the past 10, 15, 20 years. And I think that that's, it is only through representing and um, educating and um, um, standing up for trans folks is the only way where we can have an actual um, people love the world, the word equality, put it on a t-shirt, put it on a, you know, a sweatshirt, a, 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 um, a baseball cap. But what does equality actually mean? And I think right now within the LGBTQ community, it means um, being vocal supporters of trans people. With that being said, I have personally learned so much from, from, from th being a part of this podcast and being able to speak to a lot of people of more mature ages, um, <laughs> mature ages. And I think that, um, um, this goes back to listening too. LGBTQ folks need to, need to do some more listening about our history and not so much as in read a history book as more as in like speak to a, an elder gay person. Um, and that's what I hope this podcast ultimately does for people. You can turn it on and you can go, wow, I learned something about the, the past. And also I learned something as a queer person myself about this, that, or the other. So, yeah. I think, well, as, as I think that I think that this will be an interesting time for your contemporaries in a way because I feel like there's this like a line of time that for a number of people by no means everybody I certainly understand what being lesbian gay not even mention you know, transgender like in this country. I think for a number of people in, in our, I won't say movement, of our, of our, of our ilk, yeah. it's been a little bit, may have been an easier time. It's because there are images on TV. They may have not had such, um, may have had good parents and not, uh, or family relationships that were, you know, pretty liberal or pretty, you know, things were, have just been going along where, um, okay, well, we can, we can live our lives if we choose to live in a city where, you know, we have a job somewhere and it's easier to come out, you know, or just living in a rural place or whatever. That could, that could I could be wrong about that too. But I think people have been able to just go along thinking, well, things are good. We're becoming more and more, you know, yes. out there. Well, guess what? You know, look at our Supreme Court yep. and they are not our friends. They're not even objective, unfortunately. So um, I think it will be interesting to see what folks who have been, you know, just living their lives and I, something wrong with that. We want to live our lives. We're going to have to be a little bit um, active, in, in at least yeah. in something. We're going to have to make some noise. Yes, we are. Yes, in we a, are. Yes, I, that's, it's, if I get in trouble for saying this, oof, but I think that's what uh, and something negative that came out of the fight for marriage equality was that it's like we're here, we've made it, and it's like housing discrimination job discrimination 
conversion therapy, rights for trans folks. It's like marriage equality is wonderful. We haven't made it in any, any, um, we haven't made it. I I guess for the listeners who cannot see me right now, I'm doing air quotes. We've made it. And we have, and there's a, and we haven't. And I think we should focus a little bit more on the fact that we haven't and put our energy behind that. But that is a whole nother box. Uh, One thing we didn't touch on and shame on me for my work and for my own age for not saying this. I mean, we've got to be concerned. And I know a number of organizations out there are, but we've got to be concerned about our elders because um, people, there are many elder people who are in poverty. Um, People suffer from depression and people, and it's not diagnosed because I guess people, you know, medical personnel don't think that Older people get depressed, but a lot of um, LBGTQ um, elders are living in poverty, and we need to, I mean, they may not have, you know, like some families, your kids may take care of you, or maybe you have a niece or or whatever, um, or even a partner, but um, we've got to be really, really uh, careful about not letting people who fought so valiantly for our rights back in the day, in the early days, be just, you know, withering away somewhere and uh, not able to make ends meet. So I know that that's something I'm going to look into a little bit more once I retire shortly. But that's a big, you know, we need to care for them because they... You know, people older than me, which, you know, is, is a, you know, it's a lot of people, they fought even harder than I yes. had to fight. And they lived in circumstances where they, I mean, you know, we talk about, um, you know, we talk about non-binary now. And we talk about, you know, pronouns and everything. And these people, to be who they were... They had to go out and change their clothes when they got to the club because they couldn't walk out of their door dressed the way it felt like them to be dressed. So um, let's not leave them in in the lurch. And thank you for bringing that up. What I hope this podcast exists as is a testament to the things that you just said. Um and hopefully open up um, more pathways for younger folks to receive this information about the people who allows uh, allowed them to be as open as they are today. Um, but with that being said, this, this podcast is a, is a big thank you to the LGBTQ folks who came before me and many other people um, and I would just like to thank you for, for being so open and for being so willing to share your stories with us and um, sharing them with listeners across the state. Dare I say country? Dare I say country? <laughs> <laughs> Never know. Yeah. So thank you so much, Kathy, for being oh, here. Oh, you're welcome, us. Jacob. This was a wonderful experience and let's stay in touch. If you or someone you know is interested in being a guest on the show, email thegayestgeneration at aadl.org. To find more podcasts from Ann Arbor District Library, visit aadl.org slash podcasts.